Good morning and welcome to a beautiful, beautiful show. It's a beautiful Wednesday, just as beautiful as the ladies on it. And it's the week, it's the Wednesday before International Women's Day. So I think I'm going to start off by asking ladies, who is your woman crush Wednesday? Oh. Ah. <laughs> wow, so they woo -woo. Oh, oh, oh. Please, you like? I didn't even get to a, 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 a introduce a myself. Am I dreaming? Wake so up. Can I see you? Wait, Wake up. Wake I need up. you guys. So, how do you feel? <laughs> um, no, this has never happened. How do you feel? Uh uh. Wow. Uh, let me use, let me use Catherine's words. I feel gobsmacked. <laughs> You're so All right, bring the lights up. Bring the lights up. <laughs> I love it. I got you guys off guard. But I wanted you to feel oh how God. our senators felt yesterday when it was lights out at huh. the National Assembly. Why are we so dramatic on this show? Please, let's watch the video first. Let's watch the video first. <laughs> so if you guys don't know what happened, wow. let's, let's bust your brains, guys. Where are we? Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> here are the details. <laughs> On Tuesday, there was a blackout during Senate plenary. Uh, the footage just saw uh, was that of senators waiting for the Abuja D.I.S.C. <laughs> to restore electricity. No, but I love the fact that I got you. I think I'm going no, to become did. a, a, a did, practical joker. Why <laughs> are we so dramatic on this show? I, we would have just gone straight to the topic. <laughs> no, like, no. Oh, oh, oh. We're dramatic because the, the, the dramaticism is for effect and emphasis. Because imagine you're sitting it. down at the National <laughs> Assembly. You want to make laws. You want to debate issues that affect Nigerians. So and then you. they say, it's lights out. <laughs> I, guess, I can imagine how do we. You know how you just start saying, oh my God, in your language, Otio. Otio. Kilo Shele. Wow, wow, wow. You say, uh, you know, the one that uh, Christian, I played the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and I, I, trust, I trust Nigerians. Before you know, they'll start selling candles around there. Just in, case. For them, just in case. If you look at the comments, and I don't know if we have any, the reactions, a lot of Nigerians did not pity them because what they simply said Ooh. is that you guys need to feel what Nigerians have been feeling. Exactly. You need to go through the situation. So now, mm. plenary was stopped. The plenary that half the time you're always wondering, what are they really doing for us there? Giving their sitting the allowance, time, newspaper sleeping. allowance, wardrobe allowance, whatever allowance, and lights out. And remember the talk, we talked about it like, was it a week ago? Mm -hmm. The fact that all these people, including Asso Rock, yes. owe discos yes. so much yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was where I was actually gobsmacked. You were gobsmacked there, right? But we know, they won't, we, we know they won't take light um, from Asso Rock. We know mm. they won't take light from National Defense Headquarters. Even their own houses. Even their own are houses. Secure. But really, I, I don't know. Is there, maybe there was a way for you to sort of um, coddle the National Assembly when you're giving uh, blackouts or power outage to that area. But no, it might be somebody saying, you know what, you feel yeah, little feeling. You need exactly. to experience it. might it. just wow. be somebody what that did this? that. Because they were clearly disorganized. Disoriented, this everything and dead because they were not expect. Yeah, because they were not expecting. If I were there, I would have just burst into laughter. I did tell you. If they sweet my belly. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you ladies think? Do you think this situation that we're talking about and having and them having a blackout in the National Assembly could actually propel them to do more in terms of addressing Nigeria's electricity? It's hot. Mm -hmm. it, the electricity for me, my area has gotten just a little bit better, but I don't know yeah. about the rest of you if, it, yeah, if it's just changed from better. the past one month yeah. when it was horrible. Yeah, just a little bit better, like you say. You know, it'll stay longer now, but yeah. they bring it and, and then, but they take it, sha sha. I think to, in response to your question, I think that they probably may not take it as seriously because they feel as if light will still come back, anyways. You understand? Light will still come back. Oh, they've taken light. Okay, the, oh, there's a mishap, actually, somewhere. I believe that any anybody that feels like this is going to propel anything okay. is a joker. The, the only jokes. thing you'll do is ensure that it doesn't happen again so that it will not put them to shame. Mm -hmm. But that this is going to propel, oh, is this what Nigerians it, are going it'll through? It'll probably be a temporary, what, you know, like a, a temporary feeling over them that, ah, I tr you promise, know, they come I in there. You. you know, they are very well dressed when they mm. come to these plenaries. Some of them wear the traditional outfits. You know, they have different types now. They, they say there's one called Senator, there's one called... They, they come like, you know, they are going to a big event. So that in itself, the heat 
that we flow from the inside. <laughs> uh -huh. We'll make them feel for a moment. Also, well, yeah, this is how Nigeria. But do you know what I feel like? They might feel I'm more. Sure. I think they might feel more insult to their persons as senators. exactly. Now we're talking. Not necessarily that. Oh, is this what Nigeria? Nigeria is going to they be? They'll be like, "What do you mean?" It's a situation in of, the Senate. I'm they took here life. Is, exactly. Say what Nigeria. A, what's a what's catastrophe? Their Nigeria. What's a catastrophe? No. What's a... They will not say what is catastrophe. <laughs> they will use big this. Um, what's um... a gob smacking <laughs> event? <laughs> Anyways, before we go ahead, I want us to try something. I saw something on TikTok. Ladies, do this. Your mm. thumb. Thank God. Oh. And then your oh, right oh, pinky. Oh, blessings. Is if this is just your thumb. Just your, your thumb. thumb. Which thumb? thumb? My yes. left thumb yes. or my right your thumb? Your left thumb uh -huh. and your right pinky. Mm -hmm. Then switch. Uh, excuse me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> God. I can't believe I, I cannot believe I did my thumb this. like your your thumb and your right pinky <laughs> Bless then you. switch I my brain has to like <laughs> really <laughs> fun the my brain has to really you know when she said switch work. I wanted to do this <laughs> in case you're wondering what I was doing with my night yesterday from seven to nine that's what I was doing so. I literally was what's going on no do you know, okay so <laughs> there are too many stupid accounts to follow on Instagram another account yes. talked about the fact that when you look at the alphabet the English alphabet the 26 letters there are only a few letters in which your lips touch do you know I spent the night saying <laughs> oh, no. so I found out it's B M P N W I think it is so only four or five letters in the English alphabet out of 26 that your lips will touch when you pronounce Almost. You know, uh, things you get away with knowing that you honestly, don't need to know. Understand. <laughs> I, I love it that it helps us get distracted. It, get, it helps us get distracted by our reality, really, because our reality isn't pretty. So sometimes when you do that, you're lost for the next yeah, two hours. Yeah, unless your mind is busy yeah. thinking of something else yes, other so than you're lost food. For the next two to three anyway, hours. it's a good thing that, you know, of Nepa. No, uh, but work. I think that's wrong. Let me tell you why it's wrong. Okay. Is Nepa still in existence? Is it not PHCN? No, but we, we're used to see the PHCN. When you don't have light for tardy. two months, like you s <laughs> we forget PHCN. <laughs> uh, power holding company of that. Do you know Nepa what I think is it is? Power always. That's Do you what know what I think Nepa. it is? As long as even PHCN has Nepa behavior, it will always be Nepa. No, but when Nepa PHCN moves. does better, when the discos do better, we will start changing the name. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways, it looks like we've weathered the blackout storm here. We don't know about the Nigeria situation, but stay tuned, folks. It's still International Women's Week, and we will be breaking the glass ceiling right after this break as we explore women in leadership. Jesse will return shortly. Go nowhere. All right, welcome back to Just Syria. Remember, we're live on our social media platform. So if you're on the move and you can't watch us on DSTV channel 422 or Star Times channel uh, 274, you can still be part of the conversation on X, Facebook, Instagram. Just make sure you use the hashtag Just Syria. That way we know that you're watching. And we're ready to dive into our main discussion for today, women in leadership breaking the glass ceiling. And joining us is Abosade George Organ. She is the founder and executive director of the Women in Leadership Advancement Network, WILAN. Abosade, welcome to Jassiri. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. She has such a pretty smile. I know. <laughs> she has the dimple. And by the way, the last time I wore red on this show, I know what they told uh, me. Yeah. Oh. But I was going to get into that. You look like a beautiful red velvet. Oh, cake. thank you so much. I love red ruffles and was doing like she can fly. <laughs> so like it's not the same evil. thing. <laughs> I'm not going to pay evil for evil. But um, Avocidi, um, we know you as someone who has been an advocate for women in leadership. Can you tell us a bit about the journey, how it has been? Well, first of all, thank you so much um, for, for having me smile. here. I, just, I see her smile. I just smile. <laughs> Y'all are making me blush, but thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I mean, this journey of women in leadership is one that, um, you know, we have this, uh, it's, a, it's a quote by Sheryl Sandberg that we have in the office that says, um, in the future, there will be no female leaders. There will just be leaders, leaders yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so when you ask me about the journey, it's sort of mixed feelings because I'm thinking to myself, why do we still have to be talking about why we need female leaders? Because there's just so much evidence as to the benefits, right? But in terms of the journey, I mean, as you know, Nigeria, we're not doing great. I mean, you've talked about women in politics yeah, the other day. Um, and we're just not doing great. Um, so obviously in private sector, we're doing much better. Mm -hmm. It looks like the numbers are much mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. We have seen role models actually become 
chairpersons of banks. We've seen women become MDs um, of financial institutions. But that is just like, we're still not at 50%. So as you know, at Willen, our vision is to inspire a shift to gender balanced leadership, gender which balanced means leadership. we want it to be 50-50. And I think it's really important to highlight that. All the evidence points to the fact that when women lead, we all benefit. Yeah. I think it's always, you know, I'm always, I always want to lead with that because, you know, people always box this women leadership conversation into just, oh, we've come again, mm -hmm. right? We're talking mm -hmm. about gender again. They've come again. Women want to take over. No. I mean, if you think about where our country is, where our nation is, we are in desperate need of female leadership mm -hmm. because the evidence shows us that, look, when women lead, they prioritize human beings, mm -hmm. right? And if you think about what's happening today, people are hungry. Yeah. People don't have access to, you know, income. Like, those are the kind of things that women think about when they're in leadership positions. But when we're not at the table, when we're not represented, who's going to make those decisions that have a human face? And so that's why women's leadership is important. Mm -hmm. And when you ask me about the journey again, mm -hmm. I just can't believe we're still here. But we have a bit of a way to go. And as you know, I'm sure you've heard it before, mm -hmm. cultural challenges, yeah. religious yeah. barriers, you know, <clears throat> there are real issues that prevent and hinder women from actually becoming leaders. Okay, so let me zero it down or narrow it down uh, to your experience mm. so far with women mm. and in the course of your work. Yes. What would you say would be the key challenges you've encountered along the way? You say you don't understand why we're still having to explain why women are. But, you know, it, it is something my, my, my mother would say, keep saying it until you, we keep saying Absolutely. it until you hear it. So Absolutely. maybe that's what we need to do. But yeah. for you, I'm curious to know, mm. what would the challenges have been if you could enumerate them yes. as the key challenges along the of way? Of course. And let me start from the micro, mm -hmm. right? Um, the micro, surprisingly, has to do with us as women. Mm. We have internalized the biases that they have so it's one thing to say society has said women should not speak yeah. women yeah. should be quiet yeah. it's a different thing when we believe that oh. yeah. remember ariella yes. said it yesterday yeah we said it yesterday that some of the women didn't vote for us because how will you be telling our husbands what to exactly. do exactly you control our husbands exactly so that you know we women unfortunately re continue to be custodians of patriarchy yes right um but that micro level is I believe I can lead. Mm -hmm. We had an amazing um, testimonial come out of season one of our show where a, a young student who sat in the audience wrote us a year later saying, I never knew women could lead until I sat in the audience of the leading woman show, mm -hmm. right? Now, a year later, having had this mindset shift yeah. that I can be a leader, the, the Department of Dentistry in University of Lagos was looking for a department head. She raised Body her hand head. and she was elected and she's currently department president. That is the power mm. of mm. just information, remember. Mm. So this is very micro level, yes. right? Mm. So let's come up higher, mm -hmm. right? So we've talked micro. Now at the institutional level mm. is where you don't want to empower a woman. She now has agency. She now has a voice and she's ready to use it. And then she goes into an institution that thinks we women should not be at the table. So there's work we need to do at the institutional levels as well. Yeah. Oftentimes it has to do with policies, mm -hmm. right? So friendly policies around how can you create a pipeline and a pathway for women to lead. One thing I can tell you for free and for those watching, if you want to take away anything, this has to be intentional. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen. Okay. Well, these policies are created by people. They're created in rooms mm. where oftentimes women, women are not in the room. Yeah. If they are, they're one or two. They're tokens. Mm -hmm. yes. And unfortunately, we have found with women in some of these rooms, they like being the only woman. So, you know, we've, we've really, and, and that was the, the topic of the show last, last weekend. It was mm. women as allies of women. Not just women supporting yeah. women, yeah. women as yeah. allies, right? Because an ally looks out for you. Yeah. An ally speaks for you when you're mm -hmm. not in the room. Mm -hmm. Now, there are genuine constraints as to why the woman... It's a scarcity mindset, right? Mm -hmm. So there's 10 seats on the table. Oftentimes, they have slot for one woman. So yeah. really, it can only be one woman. However, things are shifting. Now, the point you made around 
is allyship, male allyship. We always say the power is currently with the men. Yeah. Then we have to have male champions. Yeah. Who are willing to, to get up. The cause, right? Yeah. I always tell the story about the House, the, the National Assembly. One of the reasons why we started pushing for additional seats for women was because, as you know, we, I mean, standard is 35% gender quota, which right? Which we've never met. Which we've mm -hmm. never met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But guess what? The question is, today, as you know, in the Senate, out of 109 seats, there are 105 men, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Only four women. Now, in the House of Representatives, we have 360 seats, 15 women, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Now, there are what, 345 men. When you say 35%, I hope you know some of those men have to go. Yes. yes. Yeah. The question was always who will go mm -hmm. when we were doing 35 of the pie. So guess what we said? Oh, yeah, shifts. Let's bring extra shifts. Exactly. That's where the additional seats came from. Mm. So to show you that there are barriers, yeah. as you were saying. And so, like I said, institutional. But now what we're talking about is even a higher level. Yes. We're at a national level. We need gender quotas. I, I, there's no other way. Even no I, and I think way. that really does start with political parties, not just about making the forms free for women, mm -hmm. but saying that as, at a specific point in time, certain amounts of seats that we're sending to the National Assembly or at the State House of Assembly, we talked about that yesterday, 993 State House of Assembly members, Absolutely. and the number for women is not even in the double digits. Yes. There are 13 states that have no woman in their State House of Assembly. At all. Yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So I, I want us to go back to this because we're talking about breaking the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a proverb, not a proverb. It's a, oh, I'm looking for the word English escapes me now. Yeah. It, it, it's a descriptive something. It's not a literal glass ceiling. Yes. But for many people who don't understand, we've probably all used it in some terminology mm -hmm. or the other. What is this glass ceiling and how does it really manifest, particularly for women, mm -hmm. in sectors and industries across uh, the country in particular? So that's really interesting because the glass ceiling, like you said, it looks very different mm -hmm. across yeah different, I guess, sectors and spaces. But one of the major characteristics is you are willing, mm -hmm. you are equipped, you have demonstrated capacity, but you can't just walk in. Mm. And one of the reasons when we talk about women's leadership that we always think about politics is because apparently in Nigeria, Politics is not something you just get up and go and do. Nope. Because it's an application. I hope yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Think about the yeah. electoral process. It's actually me applying mm -hmm. to come and serve you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to apply for a job as a CEO, mm -hmm. the barriers are not as complex, right? Because there's no party, there's no constituency, there's no godfather. There's... Do you see what I'm trying yeah. to say? So the glass ceiling is basically... I have prepared myself. I have the degrees. I have the qualifications. I have demonstrated capacity, whatever that re is required in a particular sector or space. But there's, there's just, still there's just some this wall yeah. that doesn't allow me walk through. That tells me I can only go this, this high. high. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> so because, you know, oftentimes people say, oh, yes, we want women, but when women with capacity. I'm like, excuse me at least in the history of Nigeria, let's just have women. I, mm -hmm. I, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't want women with capacity. But I feel like we oftentimes judge women based on a higher standard of yes. performance. Yes. Meanwhile, as you know, with a lot of men, they are judged on potential. Yeah. We, I, we were in Rwanda together last yes, year. Yes, we were. And I always remember somebody who represented uh, Paul Kagame's uh, cabinet coming to talk about what happened when he was setting up his cabinet and some of the M um, MDAs. Everybody was bringing their lists from around the country. All the lists were full of men. Yeah. And he said, I'm not taking these lists. Yeah. Go back and bring me women. And they were telling him that there's no... And he said, you know what? If you don't go and do it, I'll go and do it myself. All of a sudden, women with capacity... We're Change. showing up on the list. Exactly. All of us. And I, that story always stood of out course. to me it about would, the intentionality. Intentionality. That's what I was going to say. It has to be intentional. It's not one of those things that just happens. So when you say, what is a glass ceiling? It's just that thing that creates a barrier, mm. right? Mm. That oftentimes is not within your control. Yeah. And there has to be something more that helps you. So th that's why they call it a systemic barrier. Yeah. It means that it is really outside of your control. And evidence shows us gender quotas work. That's why it works, yeah. right? Yeah. Because he insisted, I want women. Yeah. So whether it was a quota that mm -hmm. he had allocated, it has to be women, right? And therefore, they get a seat at the table. So gender quotas. And let me also say that I really think we're at the point in Nigeria where we need quotas 
mm -hmm. to influence behavior change. And I'll explain. If today we say 35% women, women. Oh. in leadership across board, guess what happens at the National Assembly? Men, because there's only so much space, yeah. they now start sitting next to women. So that perception, <laughs> yeah. hold on, that perception that I have your type at home, at, uh, actually I four of your comment. type at home, it starts to shift just yeah. because you are like, well, this my type is right here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love this. Exactly. And, and I think that we are at that point where we need to force behavior change, yeah. right? Because we are so socialized in a way where you cannot blame the men for actually treating women the way they... I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I say so, my question, my 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 question is coming. Yeah. Because we're talking about policies at the high level. Mm -hmm. You can institute 35% all you want. You can make it easier for the girl child to go to school. But if you're battling religious leaders who have their members' ears on Fridays and Sundays and depending on Saturdays, whatever you believe in, and there's a, a re-emphasis of a narrative that the man is the head of the house that people want to take out and take into society, mm -hmm. then you're battling culture as well. That 35% and that systematic change will always stay mm -hmm. up here. Yeah. So if we're talking about getting young girls involved in leadership, being mm -hmm. able to see more women, mm -hmm. because you, you do what you see. You yes. aspire yeah. to be yes. what is in front of Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Let's go to the grassroots. Abosa Day, how do we deal with the cultural, religious, and traditional barriers in this conversation? So I think that's a really important question. Mm -hmm. And I think you raised the, one of the one of the signs or solutions is role modeling, mm -hmm. right? So even at the grassroots level, you know, I always talk about, and you, you have them in your local community, there's an Iyaruka in your local community. Mm -hmm. I say that because in my community it's Iyaruka, yeah. right? She will knock on doors. Like political strategy, she's got it. Mm. Doesn't speak English necessarily, mm -hmm. will mix the whatever yeah, Yoruba yeah. and Pidgin, you know, because of the parts of, of Lagos where I stay, but guess what? She gets out the vote. The question is, why has Iyaruka never stopped for a second to think, I can run? Yeah. Why am I always running for them? People mm -hmm. for myself, right? Which is what you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. she really believes that she's not supposed to be the one on the ballot. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're asking, right? And to your point, she either goes to a mosque or a, a, a religious institution where that is further emphasize yeah. that stay in your place yeah. Yeah. and as a market woman that you are continue to mobilize for the men but you cannot be on the ballot now how do we solve those issues so because my point is if you Iyaruka really ran yeah. then that girl at the grassroots will know that oh Iyaruka is not just good for mobilization mm -hmm. yeah. she can also run yeah. right <clears throat> that power of the picture that that girl sees that, oh, I saw this woman go from knocking on doors to actually being the one who got elected. Now, it is shifting, right? But at the grassroots level, because, you know, I argue that a woman without power can mm. only do so much. Yeah. Yeah. And this is both financial mm. and political power. So when we talk about the grassroots, I'm one of those people who hesitate a little bit because they lack power. Agency. Agency. Mm -hmm. So there is more work to do there around a mindset shift. Yeah. And I think that's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. To be honest, the reason why we started the Leading Woman Show is exactly what you described. Because even if we had a quota, would we vote women? That's the question. Yeah. So even if there were women on the ballot, yeah. would we vote would women? Would we vote women? Yeah. Now, if there's a perception that we have that women are not supposed to be leaders, then we wouldn't vote them even if they were on the ballot. So I, I was going to talk about that mindset shift. I'm glad that you mentioned it because we're still, you know, within the context of breaking the metaphorical glass ceiling, right? And you have used an example, for example, um, Yaruka, you know, campaigning for votes and one day just decides that she wants to run. It will surprise you to know that about 80% of people who will be against her will be women. So how do we, we've talked about the, um, how necessary it is for us to get rid of the, the you know, that mindset that women can not run, right? The question now is how do we do that, especially for women, you know, on grassroots level? Mm. How do we make this women understand that, look, 
if a woman is running, it is it is okay for a woman to run. You know, women will tell you, no, you can't, like what we, we saw yesterday, <laughs> you cannot be controlling our husband, stay in your place, come and join us in the kitchen. You know, so how do we make these women understand? It's, now we, we see that it's essential to get rid of that mindset, mm. but how do we make them see that so, they should? So, you know, this is where the intersection between economic empowerment and call it agency, call it voice comes in. If we're being really honest, mm. a woman who's not contributing financially in any way, shape, or form just doesn't have voice. I, I don't know, you know, I always, I'm very visual, so I just think about it. You are in a small household. Mm -hmm. You don't yeah. bring anything to the table. Yeah. So you're only maybe a carer and a nurturer. Yeah. With the, and there's nothing wrong with these things. I think it's important to, to, to share the balance. Down. You can even be bringing in resources and not be interested in any form of leadership. Fantastic. Yeah. But I think what is happening, what these households usually look like, unfortunately, is that the woman just lacks complete agency and voice mm. and, you know, power. And pa just at that household level, yeah. everybody says their mother is the pillar of the home. But the mm. question is always, what does that mean? Right? Mm. Does that mean she wakes up very early in the morning to prepare a meal for all of us? Right? Does that mean she's always there? Like, what does that look like? So to, I guess my point is this. We can't take away the importance of financial independence or financial freedom of sort, right? If you think about the women of old and why people would say they stayed in abusive relationships, mm -hmm. it was mainly because of their financial capacity. So what I'm trying to say is that before women can rise at all, you know, and even say, you know what, maybe I can aspire to this. Maybe I can aspire to that. They need to have some sort of agency. Voice is good. Yeah. But as you know, <clears throat> voice can only take you so far. Yeah. Because, and that's why I tell the story of the Iarukas, because yeah. they're actually powerful. But guess what? There's something missing that has not been able to help them translate. Transit. Yes. Yeah. Do you understand? And go from this sort of local mobilization level to an you know, I either I want to run or, and it doesn't have to be elective political office. Mm -hmm. It can even be, I want to be market leader. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's some financial capacity because as you know, if you want to influence people in a country where people are hungry, you know what influence means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Influence can mean, give me hope, but there's more yeah. because people are hungry. So there's a lot of interplay between the issues are not isolated. They're not, yeah. You understand. So even the constituency, because one of the things I always say in Nigeria is when we talk about leadership, we must talk about followership, mm -hmm. right? And the question is, do leaders arise to the standard of the followers or do they, you know, fall, fall yeah. to the low standard of followers mm -hmm. who are just satisfied with the four years and rotation? I, I want to share a story from when I was on radio, and that was when Hillary Clinton was running for president, president. against Donald Trump oh, then. And I had a few <coughs> callers who called me and said that they were so upset with her running. And I was like, why? They said that they didn't want her to influence the women around them. Oh, wow. That if she became president, can I imagine <laughs> how it would influence other women? Nigerian this, women now. And this was how many years ago? How many years ago? So we've talked a lot about political leadership or even uh, the policies and initiatives that need to change on that side. And you've given a bit of kudos to the corporate side of things. They're mm -hmm. a bit ahead. Mm -hmm. But we also know a lot of them pay lip service. We're going to see the events on Friday. Yes. We're going to see the pictures. We're yes. going to see all of it. Yes. But let's be honest. A lot of the corporate governance and issues around it still pay lip service to this. It's it's a trend. It's good to have, uh, we're celebrating women and leaders, yeah. something, something yeah. today. But beyond that, are we really really, truly seeing change at the corporate level. Because women are leading in fintech here yeah. in Nigeria. We've yeah. seen it. Uh, with the banking structures as well, we've seen more women. But I like data in these situations. Mm -hmm. And the data shows you that when you have women in decision-making leadership roles, mm -hmm. companies often do better at the bottom end, at the bottom line, at the yeah. profit margin. Yeah. And maybe, it's, are we going to have to make it a money conversation for many men to sign up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and, you know, but yes, you see, because that's, that's the way that... They yeah. won't feel comfy with it at all. It's money. No, yeah, but, we, but should bring I tell me you on board? I make you more money. But should I tell you what it is? One of the reasons why the private sector yeah. is way ahead mm -hmm. is because the money, the evidence is there. 
Yeah. No, look, honestly speaking, and I, I don't want to name names, but mm. look at the businessmen <laughs> in Nigeria. They are not playing. Women are leading their businesses. Their companies. Because yeah. the bottom line shows them, because men have led, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why the private sector is leading is it's more <clears throat> quantifiable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, that's why mm -hmm. we continue to mm -hmm. struggle in other areas. Because yeah. we can't quantify. Because it's difficult to measure. Oh. Yes. So, but in the private sector, to your point, if Tolu is MDCEO over a three-year period, <laughs> bottom line, chak, chak, chak. Yeah. I can see. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. evidence, yeah. right? It's clear, yes. It's clear. Uh -huh. And also, <clears throat> another thing that we see, which is evidence-based, is they bring in women when it's time of crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. so they come and fix it. Yes, broken, because they so. are great fixers, whether it's empathy, whether it's the ability to multitask. Whether it's the ability to, to nurture, hold more, to we are Olivia Pope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, back to your point, private sector is doing well now. In the in the banking sector, directly linked to something called the Nigerian Sustainable Banking Principles that has a quota. Mm -hmm. Again, this was way back eleven years ago, twelve years ago. So that is actually a local case study of mm. quotas working. Mm -hmm. Where I think the private sector needs to do better, in my opinion, as somebody who has been within the system, is care. And actually, I think the care conversation is yeah. a huge conversation. Yes, and I'll tell you what I mean. Women are time poor. Yes. 24 hours in a day, what do you use your time for? Mm -hmm. And let me also say, because I have been challenged before, that care doesn't only mean a mother caring for children. Women care for their aged parents. Their in-laws. Women yeah. care for their, you know, their brothers, their siblings, their sisters. They care. They huh? care. Mm. That's why I said care. Mm. So in a 24-hour day, women are time poor. That is why you see that women, you know, you know, everybody will tell you, if you go into the, um, you know, when all those entry-level trainings, mm. trainings, you know, whether it's in oil and gas or wherever, Almost equal male and female. Almost. But as they start rising from there. But as there, they yeah. start to rise, somebody becomes less visible, less available. And oftentimes, who do you make CEO? Is Is that the CEO? One and you see. But that CEO is usually married because there's somebody doing the work. The work. So, yeah. so you yeah. see where I say private sector, mm. they need to think about care. Mm. I feel like that is what, because see, yeah. the, sis, the woman is not the one who's going to change. It's yeah. a system, it's system. Yeah. that needs to change. And I will not lie, I think I have a counterintuitive mindset when it comes to uh, these celebrations. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I like it when they do International Women's Day, when they do Day mm -hmm. for the Girl Child, Mother's Day. Yeah. But sometimes it's like, are they trying to bombard us with this celebration so that they can make us feel seen, mm -hmm. but then we don't bother about being heard? No, so, I mean, I think I really love what you said. I always say, they say we're always talking, but we'll keep talking. Yeah. We can't stop talking. Mm. So I think that it's important for the world to stand still on this particular day and pay lip service, acknowledge. Again, it's that forcing behavior, right? Mm. Imagine if there was no International Women's Day, how hard it would be to even have a day dedicated to but women. But don't, don't, don't we think that sometimes it makes some women complacent? Okay, at least they're celebrating us now. We don't have to like now try and enforce it and be a part of them. No, so I, you know, the question is, why is it women, the burden for this change and this transformation that we seek should not be on women. Mm -hmm. It should yeah. be a collective. And that's why days like those are important. The most important thing is that we can get champions. And I think, you know, because, you know, people are listening, we should also talk about the household level. Yes. We are the ones who raise children. We are the ones. When I say we, I don't mean we alone. I know. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, we, you know, the men we know, we're the ones raising these children who will become the people in society who either support or work against yeah, women. Yeah. So I think the, the, the quicker we stop pointing fingers and really saying, what can we do, the better. So I, 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 I share your sentiment around, yeah, we have all these days. Mm -hmm. But my question would be, imagine a world without these days where a girl doesn't, you know, at least the day of the girl child now, October 11th, is a day where a girl can, you know, people make an effort to come yeah. and talk to her. I mean, at Willan, we have the National Head Girl Project. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, one girl will yeah. hear that I can be a leader. 
versus the day doesn't exist, nobody cares, right? So I think these are the things. But I think that care conversation is another be, angle. Is it should. an important conversation if women are to be leaders? All right, so I've before we let you go, final question. You touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but I think for emphasis on today and in this week, why is it imperative that we have women break this glass ceiling? What's in it for us? What's in it for women? And then what's in it for our societies when we are at the table, we're opening the door, I'm the seats can sit yeah. more yeah. people, and at the end of the day, it can get us to where? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I like to say is, um, I have twins, and a boy and a girl, and I always say that if we are not intentional, they would experience our country in a completely different okay. way. If you think about gender-based violence, and it's gender, so yes, there are women abusing men, and, but mostly there are women, men abusing women. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me, why is it important for women to be at the table in this case, it's because there are issues. It's, you know, if you think about House of Representatives, they're supposed to be representatives. Yeah. So if nobody is representing me, why are we still talking about neonatal, mm. infant, and mm. maternal mortality. Mm. Remember, so one of the stories that was told, the National Assembly, when it was built, didn't have a female toilet. It was the first fem elected female who went and wrote female and pasted it on one of the toilets. Mm. This is the importance of representation. Because if I'm not there, then my issues will not be attended yeah. to. Now, the question is, we're not only talking female issues, mm -hmm. like period poverty, like mm -hmm. maternal mortality, mm -hmm. like care, but we're talking about the fact that women often Have you ever met a woman who says, oh, I want to become a leader just so I can boast? It's just not the way that women are wired. Women are wired to fix. Yeah. So we solve problems. Now, you like data. The Corruption Perception Index, Index shows that countries that are led by women are less corrupt. If you ask a typical Nigerian, why do you want, like, what's the problem you want us to solve? They'll say corruption. Mm -hmm. So if we all want a less corrupt country, vote women. Like, it's directly correlated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I say, it's directly the, correlated. <laughs> Then things around health care for, mm -hmm. for these reasons, yeah. reproductive rights. Yes. Men are not just, it's not, we love them. Yeah. But they're just not going to sit and think about, oh, you know, ah, maybe it's important to, that women, when they're on their period, they have, yeah. those are not the kind of policies they would think about, mm -hmm. right? So general health care, mm -hmm. you also see that, we, and, and the, the world shows that women power the healthcare system. system yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's why the data or the, the markers around healthcare also improve when women are in leadership. Education is the same. But finally, just general family-friendly policies. Because if you look at the Nordic countries. I was going to go there. Yes. Sweden, Sweden Norway, All the Nordic Denmark, countries, yeah. right? They have family, so yes. it's not female. women friendly. It's not women family. friendly. Everybody family included. friendly Everybody, yes. policies. Yes. Because think about children in Nigeria. I mean, you should think about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things I always think about is why don't we have policies for the age, the ages, yeah. and children? And that's how you know a society that actually will thrive. Mm -hmm. the, the evidence shows mm -hmm. people who take care of the young mm -hmm. and the yeah, elderly, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So when you say what is in it for us. We don't want to be at the table. And of course, there's this popular analogy of you can't fly with one wing. Really, I believe that the architect of the world said male and female. And you get why. There's a reason. Yes. And that's why. But beyond that, the evidence where we have it, right? Because I always say, that's why I say we need to get to forcing behavior. Because yeah. there's already evidence, but it's as if it's not clicking. It's not clicking. Yeah. So the evidence already shows us that we all benefit when women lead. So this is why it's important. And across board, oil and gas, maritime, banking, politics, everywhere, we all benefit when women lead.
Ah, absolutely fantastic. Our boss today, George Organ, founder, <laughs> Women in Leadership <laughs> Advancement Network. Uh, Catherine is lost again, and she wants the conversation to continue. <laughs> Uh, and boss today, thank you so much. We're doing this ahead of International Women's Day, yes. but the conversations will continue. That yes. aspect of care you talked about yes. will bring you back. Yes. Let's dig into yeah, it. Absolutely. Because, again, we all benefit. Uh, yeah. Don't yeah. we want a better society, a richer oh, society, exactly. a healthier society? We all get into action. That's all. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have a hot topic for you right here on Just Here before we wrap things up. Stay with us. Now, very quickly, we want to know if you caught Peter Obi's reaction to Ukraine's <coughs> food donation to Nigeria. In his words, it was a national disgrace. And, of course, his comments were trending uh, when he made them. But now Renault Mokri has replied him. And it's like watching a political soap opera unfold you. in real time. But let's also not forget the seriousness of the issue at hand. Hunger is affecting millions of Nigerians, and it's not something for us to be uh, for us to take lightly at all. So, at the end of the day, uh, we've seen Peter Obi's post, and he has talked about, of course, appreciating the war-torn country of Ukraine for their generous donation of tons of grains to Nigeria. Then he talked about as laudable as it is, it also speaks volume for us as people endowed with all needed human and natural resources that this country officially uh, prosecuting a brutal war of national survival with its powerful neighbor Russia is still generous and kind enough with their food supplies. So let's get to what Renault Mokri had to say because it was a really big back and forth. Now Renault has gone and said it's very ignorant for Peter Obi to say that this is a national disgrace for Nigeria to receive food from Ukraine because it is a war-torn country. Peter Obi needs to be educated about Ukraine and wheat. Please fact check me. Egypt received food aid from Ukraine long before Nigeria did, and Egypt is still dependent on Ukraine for about 60% of its wheat and much of its fertilizer needs. Yet Egypt is a country that Peter Obi praises. Obi even went to Egypt to study the economy. It's rada, long, rada, ladies. Rada, rada, First of all, this rada, is how we rada, take rada. things out of context. I did. He, in said, the context. he said, despite being a war-torn country, Another person said, because it is a war-torn country, <laughs> and it has con completely changed the message. Like, I what's the message? Blessing was no, already no, no. Gone. Like, when, the, the when, first thing I saw was, okay, fine, thank you for what, what, what despite being a war-torn country. That was not even the major focus of his message. But that person now came and said it's disrespectful to say that because you are fighting war, you should not send. But that, that, that's not even my problem. My own problem is international aid, really. International food aid. Um, so please, I want to quickly food. give some more context. Nigeria has been buying grains and wheat and even oil and fertilizer from Ukraine before the war. We spend an estimated $5 billion a year importing grains from Ukraine. And also we spend money with Russia as well. Ukraine and Russia are some of the biggest suppliers of grain and wheat and whatever to the African continent. Before now, Ukraine donated to five, they said five poor African countries. I understand. We have, we're probably not using 50% of our arable land. Listen, it's a, for me, it's a no-brainer. It's an insult, know. number one. Ukraine, Russia, both of you were lovers before. Now you are, you are And you they're are part of the reason inflation and food inflation is so high. That they war. are the cause of that. What's happening between them is the cause of the destabilization around the world. Because a lot of uh, countries are reliant on or dependent on yep. them for their produce, which is okay. We're living in a world where everything... On the partage, we have to share everything and yeah. we have to trade depending on what we have. But we are a country that has everything. We exactly. are blessed naturally and the other one, Lee. We are blessed <laughs> in everything. We, we, we have land, we have everything we need. What is our problem? I keep saying, uh, so yeah. meaning that Translate. when Oyibos begin to find you like that, they are looking for something. It is not something so that is an, done it, out of the generosity. No, it's a charm of offensive. Their it's, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's agricultural diplomacy. Why are we really so excited by this? It's a national disgrace because obviously, I mean, we're talking about women representation now. We're saying, like, the only time that people would look towards, people that usually would not look at your area would now start trying to help you is because they're trying to maybe use you as a clickbait mm. or get something from you. So they're now capitalizing on our own problems. Oh, la, la. Is it a crime to call it a national disaster? Yeah. Is it not? Nigeria's natural disaster 
our, our leaders and sometimes our people. Yes. That's the biggest yeah. natural disaster. We, we, we talked about it yesterday now. Come on. Who was I? I that thing prepared my body. I used it as an example for somebody. See, that's how you people take advantage. You say people don't help you guys. People are helping you guys, but you're taking the piss. Yes, I remember the car. I did tell you. Because really, we are what we are. We do, now we did cause, which is the warriors. Yeah. We are the cause of our own problems. But we, also, but we also hope that what has been given, Nigeria did not solicit. We did mm -hmm. not ask. This yeah. was a donation. Whether you call it a charm offensive, agricultural diplomacy, Ukraine yeah. is trying to work its way into places where Russia may have had long standing. Because Russia. Yeah also help a number yeah. of African countries yeah, during yeah. independence. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation. But if this grain is in Nigeria, makes its way into Nigeria, given the current situation of things, we hope it makes it to the people that need it. You know, it's easy to solve what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. But it we have easy. to go now. Thank Consola. you so much to our guest, Abosade George Organ, for joining us as we looked <laughs> at women uh, in leadership breaking the glass ceiling. Ah, Toluya, so too much. <laughs> We're going <here. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I know what they're talking about. Yep. But we'll keep it All right, Guys, let me tell you something <laughs> tomorrow you don't want to miss i have plans if ah, you miss again if you so miss, no, walk out of this studio no. if you miss tomorrow's opening show ah, ah these ladies don't know what's coming no. for them have a good one bye bye <laughs>